Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this month's Enrichment Series webinar. I'm your host, Amir Ganad, and I'm here with Hari Nair and Colton Heward Mills, uh, whom I will introduce in a few moments. They are going to talk to us about future-proofing retirement in a rapidly changing world. Procter & Gamble alum uh, Hari is currently on a gap year as an advanced leadership fellow at Harvard, where his fellowship project focuses on future-proofing retirement. Hari has spent over 25 years uh, in driving innovation and transformation across several multinationals. He has spent 16 years living and working in Asia Pacific, India, China, South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia. Hari is also a board member of the PNG Alumni Foundation. Entangled Group Venture Vice President uh, Colton has spent the majority of his career focused on the intersection of education, work, and business. He has been a key leader in the reskilling space uh, with experiences at KIPP, KIPP charter schools, re-up education, uh, CHAG, and as well as uh, adjacent academies. Colton is a graduate of Princeton University, and he has done his MBA at Stanford. Now, uh, before I turn it over to our uh, speakers today, what I'd like to do is uh, show you a, a very quick uh, video and uh, then we'll, we'll go from there. This video is brought to us by uh, P&G Alumni uh, Foundation. So stand by for the video. It's not about where we start, where we're born, our race, our age, our religion, or gender. It's about where we're going and the opportunities that help us get there. Because when you think about it, there were opportunities along the way that helped us achieve all that we did. There were schools and teachers and mentors who supported and empowered us. But unfortunately for too many, opportunities and empowerment never come. Which is why the PNG Alumni Foundation is working to make a difference for those less fortunate by partnering with charitable organizations whose core beliefs line up with our mission and our alumni. Charities who work to economically empower those who have never been empowered through vocational training, job opportunities, and business education. All while leveraging our greatest resource, the PNG alumni. Through your continued generosity and support, our impact has been tremendous and far reaching like with Fabretto in Nicaragua, which has provided thousands of students with secondary education and vocational training. Like with Loden in Bhutan, which has funded nearly 80 entrepreneurial ventures and put over 500 people to work. And with Mercy Neighborhood Ministries in Cincinnati, which has helped thousands of inner city adults break out of poverty through job training and employment. While we've made great strides, there is so much more that we can do because there are still so many people who need education, who need training and empowerment. So many people who need an opportunity and that opportunity can start with you. Okay, Hari, I'll take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Amir, for that wonderful introduction and, and thank you everyone for participating in this uh, uh, Enrichment Series webinar. Um, the voice you heard in that video, uh, so those of us who are PNG alumni from in, in recent years would probably know that's John Pepper, uh, who has been one of the you know the most uh, foremost leaders in um, uh, in in our uh, company uh, and has been involved with the PNG Alumni Foundation from its inception. Um, I've been involved with the foundation for nearly a decade. Um, uh, I love our mission to improve the life and economic empowerment to achieve greater financial independence and economic well-being. You'll see how this connects into the talk we're about to give that Colton and I are doing, but I'd say the foundation and what we've been trying to do over the last you know, 10 years has really been trying to change people's lives. And what appeals to me about the foundation, which is why I wanted to share this with each of you, uh, is we only give grants to uh, uh, nonprofits that where there's a PNG alumni that's directly involved in the um, 
in the, in the charity or in the nonprofit itself. So they have to have skin in the game. And I think that makes it a very, you know, much more, um, you know, uh, co compelling uh, grant because we know that they're sharing the PNG values and they're uh, you know they they honor that. In fact, we've had an example where you know a couple of years ago we gave a grant to a a, a, a nonprofit where the PNG alumni um, at some point had to move away from it and then they returned the money back to the to the foundation. And that's kind of unheard of in the world of nonprofits. Um, we've had impact um, over the last 10 years, we've given over 80 grants, um, $1.2 million uh, is what we've given over that period of time in 25 different countries. So on behalf of the foundation, I'd like you to think about maybe getting involved. Um, for those of you who are on the call who are PNG alumni, um, you could get involved in many ways. Um, you can contribute, obviously, but you could also get involved in some of the work we're doing. So please reach out to us um, and we'll be able to give you more information um, through uh, emails, um, we'll, we'll share a link below uh, at the end of this uh, video um, when it's on YouTube where you can contact us, okay? So I think we can move on now to the presentation. And um, I think what's really interesting about this is when this title came out, Future Proofing Retirement, I think a lot of people thought, oh, another financial planning seminar by the Enrichment Series. And then uh, I think you'll later find out this is really not about uh, just financial planning. This is really about how we think about the world going forward and uh, Colton and I have been working on this for uh, several months now, and we're excited to share with you some of the insights that we've had, uh, and also get your feedback at some point around uh, the work we're about to do in terms of creating a potentially new solution for the future. But before we begin, um, one more polling question um, that we'd like to ask, uh, and I think you can, I think Amir will pop up the screen, but multiple choice question, um, so you can decide which of these pertains to you uh, and just answer it. I'll give you about 30 seconds to, to do this polling. It looks like we have most of the results. Great. In. Yeah. So, Amir, uh, you want to tell us the results? Sure. I am going to first of all share this with the, the participants uh, and uh, to make sure it, it should should show up on your uh, your screen. But we have 10% uh, people who said I plan to stop working after I retire. 40% uh, said part time work in my current profession. 37% uh, uh, part-time work in a new profession, 8% full-time work in a new profession, and 5% said, I don't plan to retire from my current profession. I think these are really interesting results. In fact, we when we, do these, when we did this polling question, we really wanted to know how people are thinking at this stage. And, and I think as we begin, um, you'll see that, you know, the retirement transition is one of the most uh, challenging and complex transitions that we, we, we have to make in our lives. And, and so as we move on, we hope to share with you some of our insights and, and why this is going to be something we need to really focus on in the, in the coming uh, decade here in the U.S., but also everywhere around the world. So let's move on to the next uh, presentation, next slide. Um, you know, we, we all uh, realize this through our lives. You know, all our lifetime we're facing transitions, right? From the time to birth, to school, to marriage, family, uh, work, transitions, buying a home. And, and typically during these transitions, we, we've faced a lot of support. We, we've faced, you know, we've had challenges, but there's also support systems that provide us transition during that, um, that period of time. Um, but what we, if we go to the next slide, Amir, um, what we're finding though, our research is showing that transitions when you're over 50 are very difficult. Um, you know, I started this fellowship, I'm taking a gap year, I'm, I'm almost 50, just about 50. Uh, I'm taking a gap year, uh, you know, taking time off from work to really go and see and figure out. And one of the areas that really appealed to me was, 
you know, work, the workforce is changing for all of us, right? And I, I kept reading about all these things called, you know, artificial intelligence and autonomous driving and all this disruption and all these things, robots. And eventually, you know, um, a lot of people are going to be, you know, not working anymore because we'll have machines doing the work. And I kept thinking about that. I kept, you know, thought, well, what is that going to really impact society as a whole if we stop working? Um, because that's such an integral part. Uh, I lived in Korea for a period of time, and you know, and, and I also saw that in Korea, uh, you know, as people got over 50, they were really retiring, and and kind of it, it had some interesting challenges for the society. Um, but when I b started doing the research here, um, what I found was something a, even more uh, disturbing um, in the fact that uh, we've actually had a trend, and, and Colton will share this a bit more, um, uh, that you really have seen more and more people out of the workforce after they turn 50. If you go to the next slide, you know, we tend to think about late career, and this is where we want to spend some time today on. Uh, late career is a career stage where individuals, at least in theory, are not learning about their jobs and expected to kind of keep up the performance that they've been in the previous years. Um, and we're often categorized when we turn 50, we're often categorized by you know, the system to really think of us as late career workers. And most of the transition opportunities you have you know, in your life happen kind of early or mid-career. But late career, it, it's actually kind of left up to us to figure out what we want to do. Um, so that was really um, strange because I thought there would be more opportunities as you go older, but actually we found that it's actually more, more difficult. If you get into your 60s, if you go to the next slide, um, generally people are thinking about retirement, wealth, wealth preservation, they're thinking about getting their will and trust ready, and then maybe health care. These are the kind of things that we think about mostly. Um, however, wealth creation right, um, is not really something that we think a lot about. We may think about some of our retirement planning and sort of the savings that we have like, and the interest that we get out of the investments that we made, but really, really working, and the polling would suggest that some of you still plan to work after you retire, is not something um, that we give a lot of thought, right? So this is, a, this is where the, the, the dilemma was for us as we looked at the space, said, you know, what do you really do as the workforce is changing for the future and how do we sort of rethink retirement? Um, if you go to the next slide, um, I hope this slide, so this is actually an animated slide. You'll start seeing the whole uh, world map turning blue. And what that really means is that um, in about 70 years, the entire world, pretty much including Sub-Saharan Africa, will live past 65 years old, which is sort of the retirement age, at least here in the US. Um, and what that means is that we're going to be living a lot longer post-retirement. I mean, a lot longer. In theory, you could live to, you know, already today in places uh, in the world, people are living into 90s, 100 without any problem. So that's like 25, 30 years of your life that that you're going to have to plan for, not just financially for your health, but what are you really going to do? And that's really what we want to talk about today. So I'm going to turn it over to Colton, who will kind of go a little deeper into into some of these challenges uh, that, that we face as we, as we become um, senior. Go ahead, Colton. Thanks, Hari. Uh, good, to, good to speak with you all this morning. And uh, what Hari was mentioning just a second ago is exactly right. And the work that we do at Entangle and research we do at Entangle um, has, has shown us that this is going to be uh, an important issue uh, to, to address for society. Um, and, and not only are workers going to be living longer, uh, but the, the demographics in, 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 the, in the world, especially in the U.S. are, are going to be such that there are going to be a, a much larger population of older workers uh, than younger and, and mid-career workers. And so the, the sort of demographic trends here, in addition to the aging trends, are, are going to be uh, a, a big challenge for society, and we're going to need to figure out ways to address uh, address exactly what Hari said around what what folks will do with that extra 30, 40 years uh, of their life. Uh, if we can go to the next slide here. And so this is going to pose all sorts of challenges for societies. And here's, here are some broader ones that there's been a lot of, of research on. Uh, one, and we've already started to see these trends, um, the, the loneliest uh, the generation 
that we've seen ever um, in, in, in looking at the, the group of, of folks who uh, are today seniors uh, and, and it's causing all sorts of, of issues as it relates to health and uh, uh, both mental well-being as well as physical well-being. Um, and baby boomers today are especially uh, filling this trouble as, as society changes and folks uh, no longer uh, uh, live with family, as close to family for as long. Uh, and so this is the longest generation and that's also causing uh, all sorts of other issues. And has been on the forefront of, of these trends. It's, it's as it's society has been sort of aging uh, more quickly than, than any other uh, in sort of the developed world. And uh, Japan is an interesting thing, a rise in the number of criminal offenses uh, by uh, older older folks. Uh, and so you can see in the graph on the right, uh, those over 65 over the last 25 years or so uh, have been committing more and more of a larger and larger proportion of, of offenses. Um, and so these are just sort of wider societal uh, issues that are really uh, the, the the result of the, the trend that Hari pointed out earlier, which is the big macro trend here demographically, we're seeing uh, an aging society. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And so, uh, sort of more specifically, when we think about work and and folks' works sort of desires as it relates to work, there's some really interesting research that's been done by Merrill Lynch um, about. Uh, the, the, sort of, the sort of the work desires of retirees. And uh, today, when you look at retirees who, who are over 65 and have already uh, stopped working and have moved into retire the retirement phase of their life, you, you see about 53% of people either not planning to work or not working today. Um, and 47% of folks uh, planning to work in, in some form, either they're currently working they're planning to, to work, take a break, and then continue to work. Uh, what's, what's interesting when you look at the cohort of folks behind them, so the sort of baby boomer generation and, and younger and 50-plus-year-old and uh, folks in, in, in that population who are in their late career right now, and you ask them the same, the same sort of question, 72% of them say that they want to keep working after retirement. And this, this quote from that Merrill Lynch research at the bottom of the screen here, I think is very indicative of, of what we're seeing. And it says, not working, that was for my parents' generation. I can't imagine doing, not doing anything for 30 years, nor could I afford to. And I, I think that's exactly, again, to, to the point Hari was making earlier, folks are living longer and there's a real desire to continue to contribute to society in some way, continue to be active, continue to, 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 to use the skills that they've developed over the, the, the long careers that they've had. Um, and then there's also the financial need uh, to continue working. Uh, and, and maybe not if, you know, if, you've, if you've been able to save and, and you've been able to, to plan accordingly, maybe you don't need to work at, quite at the, the pace that you were working when you were younger, but there's, there's also of a financial need if you want to continue to live comfortably to continue to be generating some income. And if we could go ahead and move to the next slide. And so uh, uh, what's interesting is today, when you, you, know, you juxtapose the 72% of people who really want to keep working when they retire with uh, what happens when folks get into their late career with employment. And, and this is some really, really fascinating work that was done by ProPublica. Uh, but what you can see sort of outlined in red there uh, is, is the number of folks who say that they lost their job uh, and had to transition from their, from their job in their late career at, uh, but based on employer-driven reasons. Um, so not because of a voluntary retirement but because uh, their uh, employer uh, either required that they, they leave due to a layoff or um, were, other, were otherwise sort of pushed out of, of continuing to work. And I think that this juxtaposed with that, that, that trend that we were mentioning earlier, wanting to work longer, is really where we're seeing the tension 
for lay career workers um, in terms of how do I ensure that I can continue to work uh, when I decide to sort of wind down my career? And can I do that on my own terms as opposed to uh, on, the, on the terms of an employer who, who decides that it's time for me to stop working or uh, on the terms of uh, a society more broadly who thinks that um, you know, by the time that I'm 55 or 60, um, I don't have more to contribute. And so uh, this is sort of the, the sort of core problem that we're really interested in trying to help folks uh, solve for. Right, and um, as just we can remain on the slide, uh, going back to our polling question, uh, you you know if you don't remember the responses, it was roughly about 90% of those of you who answered the polling questions want to keep working. So even higher than than the 72% that Colton mentioned. So the majority of people who are listening into this call right now want to keep working. And and as you said, as Colton said, this is sort of exasperated by this problem about you know you have more and more workers entering in their 50s into the workforce and looking for work as well. Um, so this is where, we, you know, I personally made a pretty big pivot from my project where I was focusing, focusing on technology disruption of what's going to happen in the future with the robots to what can we do today? Um, because I think there's actually this, this problem is actually not talked about very much in society. Um, and frankly, it is a real problem and we need to kind of get a handle on it. So uh, this ProPublica article, again, we'll post the link to this article in the video, um, in the YouTube channel, so you guys can click on it. But if you go to the next slide, um, we want to sort of share with you a couple of personas or, or potential um, um, customers who who, could, who who may be looking for some sort of solution. This is Tom Steckel. He's featured in the article. Tom is now 62. He lives in Pierre, South Dakota. Um, he spent 27 years with a big logistics company, Maersk. You guys have seen their container ships probably around the world. Um, he was laid off from Maersk um, in his 50s and, and then he, um, you know, since then he's been struggling to keep a job. He's been laid off um, three times uh, and now actually he has this really interesting job. He works in South Dakota but his family lives in Plymouth, Wisconsin. With all, all this disruption in his 50s, he's he only makes 60% of the wages he used to make, right? So that's a big uh, shortfall. Um, and, but um, the most, uh, you know, kind of more challenging part of Tom's life is the fact that if you drive from Pierre to to Plymouth, Wisconsin, um, as frequently as frequently as he does in one year, that's the distance that it takes to go around the world once. So this guy is driving back and forth. These are not short places, but just to keep a job, um, this is what he's doing because obviously, and when he um, uh, was laid off, he wasn't prepared to stop working. If you go to the next slide, um, this is a different category. Um, this is um, Jean Potter. Jean is a sort of, I call a more traditional retiree. She, she retired at Bell South um, um, and she lives in Georgia. Um, she actually took early retirement. She was really happy, looking forward to retirement. Um, she always wanted to become a teacher, so she worked on a, she went and got her graduate degree at Kennesaw State University but she's not been able to find a job. Uh, she wants to become an English school teacher, I think Spanish English um, ESL kind of uh, teacher, um, and she still hasn't been able to find a job. And she lives on a graduate stipend in Social Security. So you can see for between Tom and, and Jean, sort of the two ends of the spectrum, and there's plenty more examples. If you, if you read that article, you'll, you'll see several more, but you realize that these are people who kind of fell into a situation where it's not just financial planning that was what they needed, they needed something else at this point in their life as well. So, so if you go to the next slide, um, one of the frameworks that um, both Colton and I use to think about um, how to think about solutions for Tom and Jean and others is we ask ourselves, what's the job to be done when facing a transition? You guys might be wondering, what does it mean, job to be done? Um, this is a framework developed by a Harvard um, Business School professor named Clayton Christensen. I worked with him for many years. Um, and basically, the, if you go to the next slide, the, the question we ask ourselves is that, you know, people, all of us, we hire pro a product or service to get a job done in our life. So, so the question really is for people like Tom and Gene and others who are kind of in their uh, 50s, um, what sort of product would they have to hire when they face 
transitions like what they faced, right? So what, what would it be? And if you go to the next slide, um, you can think about jobs like this. You know, part of what they may be thinking is, you know, I want financial security as I transition, right? That's a pretty common job to be done. So that's the one piece of it. Um, I want to maintain, I want to be able to maintain a high level of emotional and social well-being when I transition. That's another job that, that uh, we have. Um, and a, big, a big one is I want to be able to reduce anxiety and maintain dignity. And this dignity is a big problem because people don't like to say, they say early retirement because that's a little bit more dignified way to say it rather than say, no, I really want to keep working, but I'm taking early retirement because that's my only option right now. So that's, that's the more honest way to answer that question. But the, the better way we think about it is, you know, how do you maintain dignity um, during that period of time? And then finally, you know, I want to be able to be resilient and ready for an unexpected transition. We have found such a high number of people who are facing unexpected transitions when they hit, hit that 50-plus um, uh, age group. So all my work here is really focused on figuring out what do we do about this, you know, um, in, in a more structural way to help people um, uh, as we transition today, before we face the future, uh, you know, a technology disruption that everybody keeps talking about. Colton's going to take over from here and tell you about what are some of the things that we're thinking about. Go ahead, Colton. Absolutely. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it's exactly as Hari was just describing. Uh, one of the things that we look at a lot of entangled and sort of broader economic uh, trends. And um, there is, I'm sure if you Anybody who's been reading the, the news in the last uh, couple of years, you've, you've heard about automation and you've heard about um, the, the transitions that we're going to face as an economy as a result. And um, one one of the uh, really interesting uh, sort of trends of the, the themes in the work and the research that's being done on this topic is um, what it means for workers in America. And in the next 10 years, you know, the, uh, the sort of blockbuster report came out from McKinsey. Uh, suggesting that up to 50 million people are going to be displaced. Uh, that's a third of the U.S. workforce. Um, and, you know, the, the average, uh, when, when those folks... Amir, you want to move to the next slide? Sorry. They're, they're going to... Yes, please move to the next slide. Um, on average, those folks are going to have a loss of, of earnings of 35%. Um, and, and that's going to be driven by some of the same dynamics that Harvey was just speaking to uh, that individuals uh, like Tom, uh, uh, you know, sort of face uh, when when they transition, which is, you know, I I have before I planned um, had to to leave the current job that I'm in, and then I didn't have a plan for what I would do next and and how I would continue to earn an income, and that has resulted in me having a gap in work, and that has resulted in me not knowing, um, you know, what my uh, plan is in terms of working in my late career, um, you know, uh, it was going to be. And as a result, you know, facing um, uh, income loss and, and inability to, to earn what I was earning before. Um, so that, that trend is affecting uh, definitely this late career population, but really um, it's going to be something that we as a society as a whole are going to really have to pay attention to in the next couple of years. Um, moving on to the next slide here. Uh, just to, talking a little bit more broadly again about what we see happening uh, in, in the economy and in Tangled, you know, when we, when we sort of sum up the, the sort of major trends again that we see, um, the, the sort of shift from an industrial economy to a knowledge economy is really uh, potentially going to leave a, a lot of folks behind if we as a society don't prepare for that. And we think that the way to prepare for it is to make sure that folks have access to continuous learning, continuous ability to grow. And that's all folks, it's, it's, uh, especially folks that have, have in the past been uh, left out of, of the equation. So low income uh, and, and, and folks with, with less uh, access to education who may be the first generation in their family to get higher education. And, and, and then definitely uh, the population that we were just talking about, late career workers. And so, uh, Entangled uh, uh, as, as a group has been uh, focused on how do we allow for the education ecosystem to uh, evolve with uh, the, the sort of economic trends that we see 
so that everybody has access to the learning and skills and, and other growth opportunity to navigate the, the, the trends that we see coming as far as how the economy is going to change again in the next decade. Let's go to the next slide. So one of the sort of uh, ways that we, we think about this at Entangled is, is we think about what we call outskilling, which is how individuals who are currently employed at a, a specific job think about the transitions out of that job into continued work, continued, uh, continued growth as individuals. And we know that the, the, at the knowledge economy, the, uh, the, the kind of skills that are gonna be required in order to be successful are gonna be rapidly, rapidly changing. The half-life of uh, skills that you're gonna be learning is no longer the case that you learn how to do something right out of high school or college and, and that skill set carries you for the next 40 years. Every, every few years, you're gonna to need to continue to learn new skills to keep up with the way that the economy is changing. Um, and, and right now, our education ecosystem is not really set up well to do that. So what we do at Entangled, again, is, is we are uh, finding ways to build infrastructure within the education ecosystem that allow for these transitions to happen more smoothly. And there, there are three groups that we've identified as particularly at risk today, given the trends and given where our ecosystem is. One is underskilled workers. So folks who already don't have access to a lot of education. Um, one is entry level workers, people who are just beginning their careers. And then, uh, and then late career workers, which is what we've been focused on today in our conversation and where the work that uh, we've been doing with Hari has been focused. Let's go to the next slide. And so um, you think about the ecosystem today and the kinds of institutions that people use to do the jobs that, that Hari was mentioning earlier around career transition and, and continuous learning. Um, there, there are a couple of different buckets of, 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 of options. Um, there are companies like Rise Smart and Lee Hacked and, and others that uh, help with career transition on a corporate level. Uh, there are a couple of uh, smaller companies like your Encore and I relaunch that that work with specific types of, of, of subgroups to, to make sure that they are prepared for uh, and understand what their options might be as, as they think about retirement or re-entering the workforce. And then there, there are sort of big uh, online educational uh, resources like Coursera and edX um, where folks can at their own pace and on their own time, if they have access to uh, computers and online, uh, learn all sorts of, of material. And then uh, obviously, as, as Hari mentioned, you know, there, there are folks that go back to school in some capacity um, and back to traditional universities, like a place like Harvard or, or a, a local university or college and, and their extension school uh, to take courses uh, uh, later in life. Uh, all of these are great ways uh, today that people try to continue to learn, um, but they do have some, some, some drawbacks. And let's go to the next slide. Um, one of the drawbacks is oftentimes uh, for the career transition services, at least that are offered uh, by companies, um, the, the work you do on, on preparing starts too late. And so, you know, maybe six months, uh, a year before thinking about taking retirement or early retirement, uh, you start to have conversations about, you know, what you'll do uh, when you leave. And, and really, you know, based on what we were just talking about, about continuous learning and, and preparation for and, and planning for what your late career and even post retirement work will look like, you know, it, would that require uh, new education in the way that it did for uh, one of the examples that we proposed earlier um, with with Jean, where you know she wanted to go back to work, but as a teacher, and would it have been possible for her to do some of the education and training uh, that she needed to do in order to do that before she retired, and and, and would that have made her transition into retirement work more smooth? So. 
you know, the, 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 one of the, the sort of key tenets of, of what we've been finding in thinking about a solution is we need to get people thinking about their post-retirement work way sooner than they typically do. Um, another, another sort of uh, main point here is uh, the transition experience is, is really not pleasant. And, and oftentimes, again, if you haven't planned for it, um, it can seem sudden when your company does layoffs and you, you thought you were going to work for another five years, but it turns out, um, given the situation, you, you are going to stop working today. Um, you know, if, if you, you've put in that position, it's really hard to, at that point, uh, think about what I'm going to do and, and to develop a plan of action. So, um, it, 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 again, the transition experience for folks who are in late career, you, you saw the, the stat that I, I showed earlier, 53% of people uh, haven't, haven't uh, sort of planned for when their retirement hits. It, it, it happens uh, uh, sort of in a forced way uh, by the, the folks that um, uh, at their company due to layoffs or due to some other event that, that's out of their control. And so uh, in, 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 to the extent that people can plan for that in advance, you know, that really uh, can help smooth the, the process. Um, in terms of another another sort of option that uh, we we really want to encourage people to to make use of if it's available to you is education benefits that are offered by employers. Um, it turns out in, in some of the research that we've done and talking to companies that um, offer these kinds of benefits to their employees, oftentimes the the the, the sort of late career segment of their workforce is not making use of education benefits. And, and to the point that we were just making about the importance of continuous learning to continue to have a fresh set of skills um, you know, uh, at your disposal so that uh, should you need to transition, you can get back into the workforce and, and really have people um, uh, take, take your candidacy seriously. Um, you know, uh, making sure to make use of all the opportunities and all the benefits at your disposal to continue learning is, is something we really want to encourage folks to do. And then finally, um, it, it, you know, I mentioned on the last slide uh, a, a bunch of, of different education opportunities that are available. Um, that's just just the tip of the iceberg. As Hari can tell you, we've looked at there's dozens and dozens and dozens of, of educational resources that you can find online. But one of the real challenges is how do you curate all that? How do you navigate all of those resources and find the things that are most appropriate for your situation? Um, and so uh, the, these are just a few of the things that make transitions really difficult, especially in late career, um, and, and that we're trying to, to solve for with our solution. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Yeah. So we're just going to wrap up here and then we'll open it up to questions. So the question is, what do you do today? Um, so in full disclosure, Colton and I are actually working on a, a new education platform um, targeted against this, which, which addresses some of those shortcomings. So um, it's not ready yet, but part of this is actually getting socializing this to people, giving us opportunity to share our thoughts. And certainly at the end of the presentation, um, Amir will share our email addresses and you guys can email us if you have thoughts and ideas. But question is what do you do today and there, there's sort of a few things that we think are really prudent to think about and, and first of all this is all outside of the realm of financial planning which I'm assuming most of you are, are thinking about because we don't think financial planning is is, is going to be enough um, we need to we need we do think of you know, learning is the key here um, so the first one is have a plan right so you know when do you really want to retire again um, I think five percent of the people in this call who did the polling don't plan to retire which is which is fine um, but then have a plan of how you know how you want to keep working after retirement um, I think one of the biggest things that we've learned is um, you know what if you had to change jobs before you plan to retire and I think that's a piece of the insight that we picked up um, really modeling the financial impact and 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 frankly the willingness to relocate seems to be one of the uh, the, the unwillingness or willingness to relocate seems to be a big driver in in some of the circumstances that we're that we're seeing um, in terms of our research. So having that conversation, um, you know, um, think about upskilling. And I think this is one of the things that I think 
uh, I learned. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to take a year and, and spend it in, in going back to school. But um, and the things you can do, you know, even without taking a whole year, even even you know, if it's a, a couple of weeks or a month, to go back and pick up some new skills. Um, I, I think it's really important to stay relevant. Of course, those skills have to match up to your to your aspirations in terms of what type of job you may want to do, keep doing, either in your current company or, or outside, but that's important. Um, the, the point that Colton mentioned earlier, which is really interesting, because we, we, were, we were able to access some data from companies who, who, who wanted to partner with us around, you know, actual um, offtake of people over 50 on education benefits. Almost all companies offer some sort of education benefits, but there is actually a really big difference between employees over 50 and those, you know, in their 20s and 30s in terms of availing of these benefits. So that's something, it's a sort of a no-brainer. If your company is offering you education benefits, figure out a way to leverage them uh, against that plan that you're creating. Um, and then uh, the next one is networking. What we found is that, uh, again, we become more and more focused and, and use the word siloed, but we become more and more siloed, I think, as we become uh, late career in our area of expertise or our area of function. Um, I think one of the great things about the PNG Alumni Network and the foundation is actually we're, we're, we have kind of created this sort of cross-functional global um, ecosystem for all of us. And I think that networking piece is key, but for those of us who are not fortunate to have had that PNG uh, network experience, I mean, this is something you'd have to encourage everyone to do. Uh, and then finally, you know, have the conversation about really expectation settings with your family and your loved ones and enlist their support, because this is not, this, again, if you try to do all this at the moment of transition, it is, it is, it is what makes those transition experiences uh, uh, very painful for people. So, so these are some things we can you can start today. Um, certainly, um, uh, you know, uh, you can contact us uh, for for more information as we evolve our research. Uh, but I think we'll pause now, uh, turn it back to Amir uh, for some questions. Great, thank you so much, Hari and Colton. Uh, just uh, super, uh, uh, I mean, just uh, awesome information that you all have shared with us today. Uh, I, I think this is a very interesting point that you made at the beginning, Hari, and you backed it up with the, you guys with the information that you shared and that we, when we think about retirement planning, we kind of think very narrowly about just the finances, but, uh, you know, having a, a couple of el elderly parents, uh, myself, I can uh, tell you that that's a part of the equation, but you guys are working on something that is really, really worthwhile relative to the vitality of, uh, of uh, people in that stage. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we do have some questions that have uh, come in and I'll let you guys uh, pick who, who takes it. Uh, but uh, someone asked uh, simply about paying for insurance. Do you have any in insight on on that topic? Um, I, are you talking about paying for health insurance, or, or? Yeah, I, I assume that that's what's uh, what's uh, being asked. Yes, but one of the participants yeah, asked I, how about paying for insurance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly in the context of. Uh, the learning side of paying for insurance, uh, but uh, you know, and in, in broadly, we'd say though the healthcare costs um, become a really strong mitigator for being able to have additional funds to go back to school. So I do think that in general, um, people tend to preserve their wealth uh, in you know in terms of their savings and it protect it for health, right? So, so I think if you know if the questioner, uh, if I had a little bit more clarity around the question around what the context is, but but if it if you don't have insurance, right, health insurance, and you're paying that out of your pocket in, in, in your 50s, then clearly that becomes an impediment uh, in terms of trying to do any kind of educational um, reskilling, right? Um, but but I, I, don't, I just don't know if there's any other um, reason for that particular question that I could maybe answer that question a little better. Col Colton, yeah. do you have a question? Mm -hmm. no, no, I, th I think, uh, the, we've got a little bit more context. Um, it's a little hard to know, uh, but I think you're right, Hari, um, especially thinking about uh, continuing to work here and, and the system that we have today, at least in terms of, uh, of health insurance in America. Um, you know, I think uh, continuing to work is, is really important because for many people, um, before they reach uh, age 65 and they have access to, to Medi Medicare, 
um, you know, they need to continue to work in order to have access to uh, insurance from their employer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so there there is that additional dynamic in addition to the income piece that we we're talking about, where if you if you're forced out of work and you don't have uh, you you don't have access to to Medicare or, or some other kind of health insurance, and you you need that access to yeah. in order to, to to continue to pay for your benefits. Yeah. So, so sounds like that that just needs to be part of the the uh, uh, planning financial planning to make right. sure that we take care of that. Uh, but here's another question: uh, Any advice uh, from Hari uh, for for an entrepreneur who just turned fifty but has a lot of energy and passion? in a chosen area of business. And I know you've shared uh, a few things yeah. that one can do, but specifically, someone just turned 50, they got a lot of passion and energy. Well, I'll take a crack at this. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, first of all, having an entrepreneurial passion is, is wonderful and having a skill set is wonderful, but but I, I can tell you from firsthand experience, being an entrepreneur um, is, an, is a completely another level, another order of risk that you have to be ready for. Um, I think the challenge often with an entrepreneur is, um, you know, you, you not only do you have to sort of uh, pursue your passion and your idea, but, you know, you have to have capital, right? You have to raise, if it's a for-profit type of venture, you have to sort of be willing to go out and, you know, uh, fund that activity in some way. And, um, you know, very often the founder or the, the entrepreneur will have to go, you know, pretty lean for a number of years or a number of months or years before you know you start making any real income so I think um, what I've seen is if you if you have that entrepreneurial passion it's it's always good to sort of figure out are there ways you can sort of de-risk um, your investment in some way if you if you have some knowledge and that's really the value that you're providing then perhaps you could partner with someone who can who can go and into that space together and one person is more funding the activities and other persons more the brains behind it uh, that that could be one approach um, but I think I think uh, you know having an entrepreneur it depends on the type of business too so if you're opening up something that is like a you know let's say you some a lot of people in, in the 50s like to get into franchisee businesses and things like that where there's you know perhaps more predictable income uh, you have to make some investments but then you know, all that I think is is, is is less lesser risk than sort of going off to something um, that you know no one's ever done before right and I think kind of figuring that out and having good advisors around you that, that can that know you really well and can ask you tough questions is another um, uh, uh, thing I would advise is, is you know be really critical about the you know with people around you around giving having them give you critical feedback around your idea and passion mm -hmm. so we have I'm sorry, we have just uh, uh, time for a couple of more questions, but uh, Colton, you mentioned that uh, a lot of people basically do their uh, retirement planning about six months before they retire, I believe you said, and you, you, you mentioned that you ought to do it way sooner. So what is way sooner? Like, what is mm -hmm. the, what is your suggestion? Yeah, and, and to clarify that point, I think um, to, to something Hari said earlier, you, know, you got to differentiate between the, the financial planning piece of this and and what I think about it, holistic retirement planning, right? So um, a lot of people start putting money away in their 401k and, and it's, it's, uh, regardless of whether or not they're putting enough away, <laughs> um, which is a whole other question. But but putting money away is something that people tend to do, you know, start doing years in advance. Um, but really what Hari and I are talking about is planning for what my life is going to look like when I retire. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that that is, it's never too early to start that. Um, you know, what, what Hari and I have been focused on is, um, I think a, a reasonable um, a thing to do is is several years in advance to, to start having that conversation, to start talking with family, to start thinking about that, and to start putting to, into action um, some of the things that, you know, Hari was just describing around mitigating mitigating your risk for that plan when you, when you retire, and that could be education. That could be um, you know uh, thinking about who you might collaborate with if you're going to start something new like building a business, or thinking about what kinds of places um, you might want to work if it's a new if it's a new industry that you're going to move into. Do you have the relationships in that new industry? Uh, can you start building those early? Right. Um, if yep. you're somebody who wants to go work for a nonprofit, 
um, it, but you've not been working in that field before, uh, can you start to, to volunteer in, in that space so you can get some experience and then start to learn a little bit um, so that you're ready to make that transition? Those are the kinds of things that people usually put off until uh, it, it's, it's literally right in front of their face. And, and that causes a lot of anxiety uh, when, when the transitions happen. Anything else there, Hari? Yep. No, I think that's spot on. And and I know yep. you have so much time, but if you want to- 30 seconds, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you could show this last slide that we have, which has our email addresses, Armir. Yes, uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna go to that next. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we can always follow up with questions with us. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you so much again, Hari and, and Colton. Uh, you know, you, you can see the, the email addresses and a few people asked a question about the uh, whether this is going to be available. We are going to have it on YouTube. And once again, I wanted to mention that this this experience is all made possible uh, by the uh, PNG Foundation, PNG Alumni Foundation. So we really value your volunteering, getting involved, contributing. Uh, to to make these happen. And again, thank you so much. We've got the uh, email addresses here and uh, just a couple of announcements that I wanted to make uh, before we uh, move, uh, we, before we close here is you can sign up for updates at pgalums.com. Uh, you can support the foundation by going to pgalumnifoundation.org. Uh, partner with us, uh, pgalums.com slash sponsor or volunteer uh, start or join a chapter or other uh, thoughts, share your thoughts at hello at pgalums.com. And if you want to look at the uh, replay of this particular webinar or the previous ones, here's the, the address. Uh, you can go to uh, YouTube and, and look for PNG Alumni Network. And while you're there, uh, please do subscribe uh, so you get regular updates. Updates. And, and we appreciate your participation. Uh, and again, always want, uh, would like to hear from you if you have any ideas or, or questions. Now, our next webinar uh, topic is going to be twists, turns, and side trips. Mm -hmm. Some lessons from a global startup. Uh, we're going to have a panel uh, from Symphony Advisors with us. And this is happening on November 12, 2019 at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And once again, we want to thank you for joining and thank you so much for your time, uh, Harry and Colton, and the perspective that you shared. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.